Chinese Communist Party is playing hardball with the U.S. Biden thinks he knows how to play, but he's in way over his head. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. It's often been said that the U.S.-China relationship is the most important relationship on the planet. The U.S.-China relationship is so important because they have the world's first and second largest economies. They spend the most in the world on their militaries. And they're considered the leaders of the free world and the unfree world. When Joe Biden was campaigning for president, he wrote that China represents a special challenge to the U.S. and that the United States does need to get tough with China if it wants to preserve its global dominance. Well said, Joe, well said. About 40 years too late, but hey, better late than never. He made promises about investing in American manufacturing, working with U.S. allies to counter China's unfair trade practices, and calling out China's abysmal human rights record. Then he got into office. Several months passed, then a year, then a few more months. And finally, Biden released a China policy. It was delayed by over a year. What was it? Aquaman 2? Was Amber Heard in this thing also? Now don't get me wrong, Biden did a lot of things related to China even before he laid out a grand strategy. He sanctioned Chinese officials over China's crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong. He angered China by saying several times that the U.S. would defend Taiwan if China invaded, although that was always walked back by his staff immediately after. The Biden administration has had a real hokey-pokey policy on defending Taiwan. Biden puts his left foot in, his administration takes his left foot out. He puts his left foot in and China shakes all about in rage. Biden also signed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act into law, which banned goods from China produced by Uyghur slave labor. His administration has also continued to define the persecution of Uyghurs as a genocide. All good things to be sure. But he's also done some things that, shall we say, were not exactly showing that the United States is getting tough on China. First, there are some rather questionable connections with the Biden family and state-run Chinese companies. Biden also dropped Trump's executive order that would have either forced Chinese-owned TikTok to sell to an American company or be banned. Biden replaced Trump's executive order with his own executive order that called for a national security review of all foreign apps, including TikTok. Spoiler alert for those who don't know, TikTok is a national security threat. Biden also shut down a China-focused anti-espionage program. Later, Biden's State Department removed a line from its website saying it does not support Taiwan independence, only to put it back in again after China complained. Left foot in, left foot out. What's this policy all about? And then it totally botched a summit that was meant to promote democracy, but ended up just making the U.S. look like a tool for communist China. During the summit, Taiwan's digital minister did a slide presentation that included a map with Taiwan a different color than mainland China. After the map had been up for about a minute, her video feed was cut. The White House was concerned that differentiating Taiwan and China on a map in a U.S.-hosted conference could be seen as being at odds with Washington's one China policy. So they essentially abandoned people because they were a different color? Not very woke, Biden administration. The ironic thing is, if the U.S. had done nothing, it probably wouldn't have even made the news, and Beijing would never have known. But hey, when you don't have your China policy in place yet, it's easy to forget your position on little things like this, I'm sure. Secretary of State Antony Blinken finally unveiled Biden's China policy last May. And surprise, surprise, it promised to get tough on China. China is the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do it. The goal of the strategy, Blinken said, was advancing the United States' vision for an open, inclusive international system. Which sounds nice. But if Taiwan gets shut down for being a different color on a map, I'm not sure how inclusive that's really going to be. The strategy has three main pillars. The U.S. investing in itself, 
working with allies, partners, and others, and outcompeting China in strategic areas. So how has the strategy worked so far? I'll tell you right after this quick commercial break. Welcome back. The Biden administration released its China policy one year ago this week, and the strategy seems to be about as clear as when there was no strategy. In some areas, the U.S. has, as Biden put it, gotten tough on China, while in other areas, not so much. To start, let's look at how Biden is getting tough on China. When he came into office, Biden ripped up a lot of things Trump did on foreign policy, but one of the things he left in place was the tariffs on Chinese goods. Those were left over from the U.S.-China trade war, when China wasn't holding up its side of the trade deal Trump had negotiated. So the U.S. put tariffs on billions of dollars of Chinese goods. Biden's U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai has stated repeatedly that they offer a significant piece of leverage to get Beijing to change its unfair trade practices, which is why Biden has kept them on. This is really important because if Biden had lifted the sanctions, that would signal to China that it can break the rules and the U.S. won't do anything about it. And China breaks a lot of rules. They're like a cat looking you in the eyes as it slowly pushes your coffee cup off the counter, then saying, oops, sorry, only they don't say sorry. Come to think of it, neither do cats. Anyway, speaking of China breaking rules, one of the things Biden did was to create a China house in the State Department to coordinate the U.S. response to all the different threats coming from China. It's officially called the Office of China Coordination. And according to Blinken, it draws on expertise from across the department to help implement U.S. comprehensive strategy to responsibly compete with China. Now that sounds good and all, but only if the administration is serious about getting tough on China, which in some cases, it doesn't seem like it is. More on that in a bit. Another major thing Biden did in the U.S.-China relationship was signing the Chips and Science Act into law. This delivered on one of the pillars of the China strategy, which was to boost U.S. manufacturing by investing in American innovation. Biden claimed it wasn't meant to hurt China. My desire to increase U.S. manufacturing and jobs in America is not about China. I'm not concerned about China. But the White House fact sheet on this says very clearly it's meant to counter China. Does Biden ever talk to his own administration? Every time he says or does something, they contradict him. I'm waiting for him to say White House and an official to come out and say, it's actually pink now. But the really significant thing Biden did on microchips was to ban certain advanced chips from being sold to China. These are used for things like artificial intelligence, advanced military equipment, and supercomputers, all of which pose a threat to U.S. national security when in China's hands. That, plus supply chain disruptions, caused a 25% drop in China's chip imports in the first two months it was in effect. Amazing, a law that is actually effective at what it's trying to do. At the same time, the U.S. is fast-tracking weapons to Taiwan, so it can defend itself from a Chinese invasion. But since China considers Taiwan to be part of China, I'm sure they would just say, the U.S. gave weapons to China to defend itself from itself. Thanks, Joe, I'm definitely not seething at you for giving weapons to me. This is good news because U.S. weapon deliveries aren't always the most timely. And speaking of sending weapons to allies, the U.S. and the U.K. have worked out a deal to send nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. Now, just to be clear, these aren't nuclear weapons they're sending. They're just powered by nuclear technology, which is what makes them so valuable. They don't use conventional diesel engines, which makes them a lot quieter, and that makes them harder to detect, and they can travel a lot farther. The deal was one of the first under the AUKUS Security Alliance, a defense partnership set up between the U.S., the U.K., and Australia in 2021. Now, the White House denies that it was created only to counter China, saying North Korea, Russia, and other countries pose a threat in the Indo-Pacific as well. But China doesn't see it that way, and I don't think anyone else does either. In its mission statement, AUKUS talks about promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific that is secure and stable, and the main threat in the Indo-Pacific region right now is China. The U.S. is also part of another Indo-Pacific security alliance with India, Australia, and Japan called the Quad, 
or if they were cool, the Quad Squad. Last year, they agreed to create a near real-time database of information about ships at sea that would use commercially available tracking data to monitor illegal fishing, maritime militias, and clandestine transfers of goods such as weapons. Chinese fishermen have not only been known to poach in other countries' territorial waters, but have been used as de facto coast guard ships for protecting China's interests at sea. So that covers checking China's technological and military power. But Biden has been working to counter China's economic influence in the region as well. Last year, he launched the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF. The IPEF is a trade bloc that's trying to be an alternative to China's Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. Here's all the countries in the U.S.-led Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And here are all the countries in China's Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. As you can see by all the countries in purple, there's quite a bit of overlap. Uh-oh, we just made those countries a different color. Quick, cut the image before China gets mad. It's not exactly a secret either that the U.S. is trying to have more of a footprint in the region. At the launch of the partnership, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo called it an important turning point in restoring U.S. economic leadership in the region and presenting Indo-Pacific countries an alternative to China's approach to these critical issues. Now, whether Biden's partnership will actually get off the ground remains to be seen. There are skeptics who say that while it's very ambitious, whether it can deliver is another matter. What the partnership will look like exactly is still being hammered out. But if it does become a hub for U.S.-Asia trade, it would advance Biden's China plan, which is all about working with other countries to counter China's influence. So Biden has done a number of things to put the U.S. on a stronger footing in its relationship with China. But there are also a number of missteps he's made that I would say have set the U.S. back as well. I'll talk about those right after this quick commercial break. Welcome back. The Biden administration seems clear-eyed on how much of a threat the Chinese Communist Party is to the U.S. and the world. But it's also shown over and over again that it still doesn't understand the fundamental nature of the Chinese Communist Party. The U.S. is in an ideological war with China. China is a Marxist-Leninist regime. This is something the Trump administration understood. Then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo specifically called it out. That is not something the Biden administration has done. And because of that, the Biden administration operates as if China were just another normal country that the U.S. can work with. For example, in his China policy speech, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. still wants to work with China in a number of areas, one of them being climate change. Climate is not about ideology. It's about math. There's simply no way to solve climate change without China's leadership the country that produces 28% of global emissions. It's true, China produces more greenhouse gas emissions than all other developed countries combined. Of course, China has said some nice things regarding climate change, like that it's going to cap CO2 emissions by 2030 and be carbon neutral by 2060. But they're building coal plants like there's no tomorrow. Sorry, I said that wrong. They're building coal plants like they're trying to make sure there will be no tomorrow. What the Biden administration doesn't seem to understand is that the CCP has never made a promise or a deal it's not willing to break. Whoops. Sure, it promised to be carbon neutral by 2060, just like it said it wouldn't militarize islands in the South China Sea. Then, just a few years later, guess what it did? The same thing happened with fentanyl. Blinken thinks the U.S. can work with China to stop fentanyl smuggling coming from China. To counter illegal and illicit narcotics especially synthetic opioids like fentanyl that killed more than 100,000 Americans last year, we want to work with China to stop international drug trafficking organizations from getting precursor chemicals, many of which originate in China. That sounds like a rational approach if you're dealing with a rational government, but the Chinese government is not. Not only is there evidence that high-level Chinese officials are working with Chinese triads on drug smuggling, but Chinese banks are involved in bankrolling it as well. Why hasn't the Biden administration learned from Trump's experience? Or Obama's? They both got Xi Jinping to agree to crack down on fentanyl coming into the U.S., only to see no results from that promise. In China's eyes, fentanyl smuggling kills two birds with one stone. 
It destabilizes the U.S. by killing 70,000 U.S. workers and would-be soldiers every year. And it creates a distraction from all the fires that China is lighting for the U.S. in other parts of the world. It also has the added benefit of creating friction between the U.S. and Mexico, because the fentanyl is often shipped to Mexican cartels who smuggle it over the border. Not to mention the chaos it causes all over the U.S. when the parties start arguing over border policies. Now, I don't want to say that Blinken doesn't see any of this. He does seem to understand that China isn't going to do diplomacy like a normal country. Or if it does, it will only be to string the U.S. along, holding out on concessions and then using them as leverage to get what China wants out of the relationship. We stand ready to increase our direct communication with Beijing across a full range of issues. And we hope that that can happen. But we cannot rely on Beijing to change its trajectory. So we will shape the strategic environment around Beijing to advance our vision for an open, inclusive international system. It's good that he recognizes this, but the Biden administration's actions aren't in sync with what Blinken is saying. It's been practically begging the Chinese government on its knees to resume high-level talks. Do you want some chapstick? Gotta make sure your lips are nice and soft while you're kissing up to authoritarians. This means the U.S. isn't just shaping the strategic environment around Beijing like it said it would. It still thinks it needs to make nice with China to keep the relationship from tanking. The problem is, by telegraphing this, the Chinese Communist Party knows what the U.S. wants and will use it as leverage to get what it wants. Oh, so you want high-level talks? Well, how about you stop containing us with sanctions and export controls? That was literally what the Chinese Foreign Minister, Qing Gang, told the U.S. Ambassador to China this month. According to a readout from the Chinese Foreign Ministry, he said, the U.S. should not talk about communication while continuously suppressing and containing China. Containing us. You know, because it'd be cruel and evil to contain people against their will. Who would do something like that? Yes, China's the one being persecuted in this relationship. Biden trying not to anger China has also gotten in the way of his other foreign policy goals, namely promoting human rights. Take John Kerry, Biden's international climate envoy, for example. Kerry has reportedly clashed with other administration officials because he wants to downplay China's human rights abuses so he can get China to make a climate change deal. It's a similar situation with the spy balloon. Ever wonder what happened to the FBI investigation into what was on the thing? Well, according to Reuters, those findings weren't made public and other China sanctions were delayed because Blinken was trying to reschedule his visit to Beijing. One Chinese official confirmed to Reuters that a renewed Blinken visit would be more likely if the U.S. accommodated Beijing's wish to shelve the spy balloon issue, adding that China had conveyed it did not want the FBI to release details of its investigation into the down balloon. Well, I hope Blinken enjoys his trip, and he remembers to pack lots of extra chapstick. Now, it's pretty sad that after talking about this for over 10 years, we still see this thing happening over and over again. The only way to make the Chinese regime change is to force it to change. You're not going to get China to play nice just by playing nice yourself. China is a bully, and you have to treat it like a bully. Remember, China wants to replace the U.S. as the world's superpower, and there's nothing it won't do to make that happen. Once the U.S. sees where China's coming from, it will be in a much better position to negotiate. So what do you think of Biden's China policy? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, China Uncensored is able to keep making videos like this because of viewers like you. Join our crowdfunding campaign on patreon.com slash China Uncensored. All it takes is as little as a dollar per episode. You can also set a monthly limit. And as a thank you to supporters, I answer their questions at the end of each episode. Today's question comes from Steve Rogers. Hi, Taiwanese here. Thank you for clarifying the myth that it's the U.S. that's endangering peace in the Taiwan Strait. Without the U.S., the CCP would have invaded Taiwan long ago. It's the number one reason that's stopping this from happening. Still, I'm very worried by 2027, the CCP would be confident enough it could win the war and invade us. What can an average Taiwanese like me do to prepare for war? Should I start prepping now? First of all, thank you for your service, Steve Rogers. Now, there are a lot of things you can do to prepare. 
I don't think it would be a bad idea to learn how to use a gun. Having emergency supplies is also always a good idea for any emergency. But there's also a lot of things you can do to help prevent an invasion. Taiwan has a thriving democracy. Make sure your elected officials understand the China threat and support Taiwan's military. Boycott companies that undermine Taiwan's security by doing business with China. China is Taiwan's biggest trading partner. That is insane. Also, talk to your friends, family, and neighbors. Make sure they're all on the same page, too. Because at the end of the day, it's much better for us to stop a Chinese invasion before it happens. Thanks for your question and your support, Steve. And thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.